that that's what the freedom of association means. And yet, from 1982 until 2015, it took more than 30 years before the Supreme Court actually came back to that original purpose and recognized, yeah, you're right, the right to unionize, the right to bargain collectively, and the right to strike are fundamentally protected under the Charter of, uh, of Rights and Freedoms. They are the way in which freedom of association is expressed in um, the workplace. Um, so when I think about that, there's a lot that has been said um, about the freedom of association. And when the courts talk about it, they get very uh, misty-eyed. Um, about it. It's, um, they talk about how the purpose of freedom of association is to advance the collective action of individuals in pursuit of their common goals. They talk about how freedom of association is indispensable in the functioning of democracy. It recognizes the profoundly social nature of human endeavors and protects the individual from state-enforced isolation in the pursuit of his or her ends. Um, it's empowering and it's aimed at reducing social imbalances. Um, I'm giving you all these quotes. This is not my language, this is the language of the Supreme Court of Canada, which is not um, known as a radical institution. <laughs> but they've said that the freedom of association protects effective participation in society because it's through freedom of association that individuals are able to ensure that they have a voice in shaping the circumstances integral to their needs, rights, and freedoms. Um, we value the guarantee enshrined in Section 2D because it empowers groups whose members' individual voices may all too easily be drowned out. And so at its core, the court has recognized that freedom of association, one of our fundamental rights, is about enabling collective action. Um, they recognize that this is what people do. It is absolutely a natural thing for people to join with others in um, acting in common. The right of association therefore appears almost as inalienable in its nature as the right of personal liberty. No legislator can attack it without impairing the foundations of society. That's pretty fundamental. Um, in 1987, Chief Justice Dixon um, someone perhaps who had a remembrance of uh, the general strike as uh, uh, someone from the prairies, um, said that the role of association has always been vital as a means of protecting the essential needs and interests of working people. Throughout history, workers have associated to overcome their vulnerability as individuals to the strength of their employers. The capacity to bargain collectively has long been recognized as one of the integral and primary functions of associations for working people. Oops. What the um, courts have also recognized is that the reason that we protect freedom of association as a fundamental freedom is because it's absolutely necessary in order to correct the power balances that, have, that exist in society and that exist in particular under capitalist organizations. Um, again, Chief Justice Dixon wrote that freedom of association is most essential in those circumstances where the individual is liable to be prejudiced by the actions of some larger and more powerful entity, like the government or an employer. An association has always been the means through which political, cultural, and racial minorities, religious groups, and workers have sought to attain their purposes and fulfill their aspirations. It's enabled those who would otherwise be vulnerable and ineffective to meet on more equal terms, the power and strength of those with whom their interests interact and perhaps conflict. And again, most recently in 2015, the right to join with others to meet on more equal terms the power and strength of other groups and entities is the essence of the freedom of association. That's why we care about it. And the ultimate question is to determine whether the measures that have been taken by the state disrupt the balance between employers and employers that freedom of association seeks to achieve. So, the other element that's important, I guess if I go back to that, what the court has recognized is that 
Um, again, uh, the right to organize, the right to uh, bargain collectively, and the right to strike are the ways in which freedom of association operates in the world of work. And work being such a fundamental social area of our lives, it is um, the only area in which freedom of association has really been analyzed. In Canadian jurisprudence, freedom of association means the right to unionize, to bargain collectively, and to strike. But in going through that analysis about why we protect the right to strike, um, in uh, 2015, when the court in the Saskatchewan Federation of Labor case recognized the right to strike as protected under the Constitution, um, they said that it is something that we have exercised um, since long before any statutory protections for it. And so that's where um, I want to come back to what, uh, what Alia was saying. The right to strike exists inherent in us, in our power as people together. It's not dependent on a gift from the state under any particular collective bargaining legislation. And while in the early years of um, the Canadian state, the freedom to strike was existed, anyone could strike, employers also had the freedom not to employ you or to terminate you. Um, in 1870, uh, uh, up until 1872, engagement in a union was um, a criminal act of conspiracy. But after that, um, it was when um, acting together in a union was no longer considered a crime, um, people were able to exercise their political power. And through that political power, were able to force a recognition that employers um, uh, were no longer free. To, uh, to terminate people for exercising that right. And that, that did bring us into labor legislation, which has been a compromise on that power, and had, in, had, in many ways has domesticated our fundamental uh, power of collective action. The courts have recognized that the freedom of association does not protect any particular form of labor relations legislation. Um, and that any legislation that exists is in fact a representation of that compromise. But what exists underneath it all, what gives rise to any of that, is the freedom to strike, the right to strike. Um, and any restriction on that must be assessed to, uh, about whether it does get in the way of um, disrupting that balance. And what we're, the place that we're at right now very much is that we have labor laws that have handcuffed us, have created a certain idea about what it means to be in a union, how to unionize, and how to exercise that collective action in very narrow channels. But that legislation is completely out of step with our current fissured workplace. It is impossible to unionize on the terms um, that were developed there when you've got a workplace that is um, stratified through multiple layers of subcontracting where workers um, don't have a common physical workplace but are dispersed. When you think about um, home-based care workers who never see their colleagues but are moving constantly between one workplace and another, um, trying to cobble together the hours of their work, who are holding multiple jobs in the same sector because no one employer is going to give them enough hours for a living wage, it's impossible to organize in that context under the legislation that we have. When I um, first started as a lawyer working with the, the garment workers, uh, what we were arguing for back then is something that we're still arguing for now, which is the right to broader based bargaining, where we can organize um, sectorally um, and regionally outside the definitions of an employer-based workplace. We heard yesterday um, about the uh, Toronto Airport workers and how the employer there has very um, carefully and strategically divided up workers into tiny units that don't have collective power in and of themselves. And if we continue to organize on that basis, we're playing into their game. And so here's another part where I think it's interesting to see what the court has given us. And I don't, I, I want to recognize that I don't think that you win power through the courts. But I think that um, when we think about how to exercise 
our collective political power. We have to think about all the tools that we have at our disposal. And using their words against them is one of those handy tools. What the court has recognized, in addition to the fact that we have a pre-existing fundamental right to organize and to strike that exists outside of any legislative protection, is that where there is legislation um, that has uh, so domesticated the way we operate as workers, um, it has in fact made it difficult for people to conceive of organizing outside that mm -hmm. and to have the actual power to organize outside that. And so what the court has said is that there are circumstances in which the state will have a positive obligation to enact legislation which enables people to, in fact, exercise their fundamental rights, which means that there are circumstances in which the court or the, the state has an obligation to introduce legislation which enables workers to unionize. Um, what the court has recognized is that, again, here, the freedom to organize is unique in the constitutional fabric because it's as difficult to exercise as it is fundamental. And that legislative protection through which our history is woven is what has handcuffed us in many ways. But if we think about um, other alternatives um, and where organizing is really happening, there are so many movements. The people who are bringing the life and the energy to worker mobilizing now are people who are coming from outside of labor movements, people who are non-unionized workers. Um, the Fight for 15 has been phenomenally um, uh, powerful in moving uh, the agenda forward. And yes, there is union support, but the people on the front lines are non-unionized workers. Um, the, uh, there's also the, the work that is being done by uh, my migrant workers. I've, been, I've spent most of my 30 years of my career working with workers who are um, on the margins, who are um, migrant workers, who are um, undocumented, as well as folks who are unionized. But again, these people who um, are here on the most precarious of terms are the ones who are also bringing creative energy to the movement. Um, care workers, the Filipino care workers who I've been working with my um, entire career are again pushing that envelope forward. And again, um, uh, CU, uh, CUPW organizing uh, workers in the gig economy. These are the areas where uh, real precarity happens and where um, it, the need to act is so urgent. When you have lost everything, when the, the situations are so precarious, you have no choice um, but to act. And in that context, when we look at the fundamental right to organize, to bargain, to strike, um, the obligation for the state to ensure that that's a real right, that it's not something that just exists on paper, are there other protections? It's interesting to look at um, the National Labor Relations Act in the US under Section 7, which uh, protects not just the right to organize, form unions, etc., but to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. When that was introduced in the States, it was seen as a way to drive a wedge into the unionized labor movement by allowing company unions and others to organize. Um, but in the current era, it's been something that has converted the freedom to strike into a right to strike for folks who are not unionized. Um, so when you think about the fast food workers in the States who are organizing and striking, they're having access to that protection um, for collective action for mutual aid right, as a way to defend against um, employer attempts to, to terminate. Um, so that is something that we can, we can look to. It's something that workers were asking for in the most recent um, round of reviews of labor legislation in Ontario and at the federal level. Um, and again, the issue of 
bargaining beyond the employer-defined workplace into broader, broader-based bargaining continues to come up because it's a reality that people are working not in one place um, but in sectors and moving um, beyond um, between the multiple fissured workplaces that employers are organizing. So the more that we play along with those boxes, the more we feed into the success of um, capitalism because as we were discussing yesterday, it's driving those wages, creating those divisions that is the core of capitalism and in its current particularly predatory forms, um, we need to step out of that and find the solidarity that is the basis for a general strike. Um, what we've seen, even though these, um, these rights are um, recognized by the courts as fundamental, as critical, as indispensable to democracy itself, is that um, governments are routinely acting as if um, those rights don't exist. Um, uh, Alia made mention of the Canadian Federation for Labour Rights, which has since um, has been tracking legislation that has impaired the constitutional freedom of association since 1982 when the Charter came into effect. Since then, there have been 226 and rising um, pieces of legislation at the federal and provincial levels that have been a direct attack on the, bil the ability of workers to unionize um, and to exercise the right to strike. There have been 89 complaints to the ILO for the breach of our international <coughs> obligations to respect the right to, to unionize, bargain, and to strike. And this um, continues in an era where there's um, increasing defiance with governments preemptively um, attempting to stop the right to strike, as happened in the um, airline workers' strikes and, and Cup W a number of years ago, and as we've seen with Ford threatening months in advance, um, that don't you dare exercise your collective rights because I will invoke the notwithstanding clause. So, on the one hand, we have this language that speaks to the fundamental nature of our rights to act together collectively. We have government defiance, but we also have movements that are growing, um, whether it's um, indigenous rights movements, um, movements for racialized justice, um, movements for climate. All of these movements are, um, are growing and the ability to build, the necessity to build alliances across those movements is, is real and recognized. We have a new generation of organizing that is movement driven, that is coalition driven, that is a solidarity movement. And when I see um, last week the migrant workers um, joining with climate justice activists in endorsing um, the Green New Deal, this is a way in which we are building the foundation for a true general strike. While um, in our, our history we have looked at strikes largely as labor movement actions, and the courts have recognized them as labor movement actions, they've also restricted them when they step outside those lines, right? Secondary picketing um, and so on. But what they haven't really cracked down on are political strikes. Um, because those are different. They're an exercise of freedom of expression and the manner in which people choose to exercise that freedom of expression does manifest in collective strike action. Um, in 1997, when um, Mike Harris was the premier, um, the teachers all went out on a political strike for 10 days. And at the time, the court said, well, we don't recognize um, the right to strike is being protected under the charter, so they don't um, succeed on that ground. Um, but the freedom of expression is really critical. If they've chosen to exercise it in a different way, other than a strike, maybe um, that would have been acceptable. Except the legal landscape has changed, right? The right to strike is now absolutely recognized as a fundamental right. The freedom of expression is recognized as a fundamental right. And exercising that political will together in broad coalition is something that gives us the foundation for a 21st century general strike that can bring us all together
to get at the real root of this, which is not individual employers and individual governments, but the entire system of predatory capitalism that divides us all. So I look forward to seeing you out on the lines. Thank you. Thank you.